gotta get your brain right if you're trying to make a million dollars If you ain't gonna do it for yourself, then do it for your mama Only stay surrounded by them people if you know they solid Elevate your hustle up today to double up your profit Trying to learn some game, it's every y'all gonna talk about it No Deanna, speak that shit that everybody vouching Ain't no more excuses valid, get up off the couch and get up in your bag To your bank account, need an accountant What's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the greatest show on earth, the Man of Mindsets podcast. I am your host, Xavier Sinner, with the wonderful Deanna Kent. We back in the studio. What's up, D? Back in the studio. What's up, Jay? How yeah, you man. feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling good, man. Last week, was a, uh, it was a legendary. We did a le- legendary episode with the great Aisha Selden. If y'all haven't checked the episode out, go make sure y'all check that out ASAP. Mm-hmm. And before we start the show, I just want to remind all you guys, if you guys could... Uh, like, leave a leave a five star rating, a review, a comment, subscribe. We're trying to get those subscribers up, so please, please, please do all those things. We greatly appreciate it. And before we start the show, Deanna, she's gonna get into our first sponsor. Yes, sir. So with that being said, it's time to get fit and get paid with the Lean and Six Body Transformation Challenge, brought to you by Commando Athletics. You guys know here at Millionaire Mindsets, we are firm believers that health is wealth, and this is a perfect opportunity for you to make your health a priority. This six-week challenge comes with easy-to-follow workouts and meal plans so that you will see results in no time. Minimum equipment is needed for both the home and gym option, and all fitness levels are welcome to enter. And the best part about this challenge is that the top five performance all, performers all get to walk away with $1,000 each for having the best six-week transformation. All you got to do is sign up, show up, and show out. This challenge starts October 11th and ends November 20th, and it will cost you only $79 to enter. So you can sign up today at www.commandoathletics.com. Yep, and the link for that is in the description of this podcast. So, like she said, if you uh, you interested, you're trying to get you're trying to get fit, trying to get paid to get fit, yes, sir. go to the link of this podcast description, click that link, and get started. So, get right into the show. Today is another dope episode, man. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get this episode done. We got two gentlemen that's killing it in the industry they, they're in. And uh, Brian, he's been on, I, I checked earlier, he was on like a year and a half ago. So, mm-hmm. I'm, so, I'm happy to have him back. And this is George, first time. Like I said, we got Brian and George here today. Welcome to the show, y'all. What's good? Man, what's, what's good? On, Appreciate y'all having yeah, us. Yeah, we, 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 um, we happen to have you guys here, man. So mm-hmm. um, getting right into it, man. I, I, I don't really do the small talk. I like to get right to it. So the people, <laughs> that, so the people that, that, that may not know, that, that may not know who you guys are, do you mind just giving some uh, background for both of y'all? Whoever want to go first, y'all good. Yeah, so for those who don't know me, Brian Robinson, a.k.a. the infamous CPA, um, I started my career in public accounting a couple of years ago in big, at the big four, one of the big four accounting firms, PwC. But now I'm a full-time entrepreneur doing real estate, doing a couple flips. I've had, you know, some rental units as well. But my main thing right now is rental cars. So I've been investing in a rental car space for the last three years. And now I help people start scale and automate their rental car businesses. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Uh, George Waters, a.k.a. The Wealthy G. Um, so for me. I'm a financial advisor. I still work my nine to five, um, but I create a lot of different streams outside of my nine to five. Um, I'm in real estate. I have a few rental properties. I'm working on a flip right now as well. And within the past about year and a half, two years, I've been able to scale a nine car rental car fleet, um, utilizing a lot of different creative finance and strategies. Um, just been able to scale that thing quickly, man. So right now, representing the... Uh, the corp- corporate preneurs, I call it. Corporate you know preneurs. I, mean? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Go I ahead. I was going to say, uh, fun fact, a lot of people don't know this, but Brian used to help me out with my accounting homework, you know, back <laughs> before I got that bachelor's degree. <laughs> so shout out to Brian. Yeah, shout out to Brian. <laughs> sure, hey, that's <laughs> a heavy shout out right there. She was going through it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you came through for it. You came yeah, through. your teacher used to be on one. For yeah, sure. for real. I'm like, please. <laughs> on. So, so um, y'all, do y'all buy car, y'all buying cars together now? Nah, so we just do the digital space together. Okay. So yeah, we all we have separate fleets. Okay. Yep. I know you have what Philly and I think another uh, I'm state. In, I'm in Philly and DC. Okay. How yeah. many you say you got nine? Nine. Yeah. How, how many you got now? Right now I got ten. So I had eighteen, but man, the market is crazy right now. So I sold off a lot of my vehicles, uh, just capitalizing on the used car market because prices. Oh, up. the prices. Are prices up. up like oh, yeah. man. I, like for example, I bought a Toro- Toyota Corolla last year. For ten bands, 
that them things like 14 15k right now mm. and it's crazy it's really crazy mm. i've never seen nothing like it yeah we we, we got to get into it so let's take let's take it back before y'all got nine before y'all got ten y'all obviously had to start at zero yep. so let's take it back to that first car and like well first what made y'all want to get in this industry number one secondly the first car y'all purchased like how did that deal did y'all go buy cash did y'all uh, finance it like how did y'all do it yeah so for me um I wasn't even thinking about the rental car space. I was actually trying to get a, a multifamily building in Chicago. I wanted to house hack, but I was scared to do a renovation. So I'm looking for a couple of months. Really was priced out because the price points, they was just crazy at the time. So I took a step back. One of my homies, he was doing a rental car biz and he introduced me to it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it out. You know, I was a busy, busy nine to five working 70 hour weeks and my car was literally sitting. So I already had a vehicle, this 2016 Ford Fusion. So I tested it out, put it on this platform called Hire Car, and it was rented the next day. And literally, it was rented for 36 days straight, and I made yeah. 1200 That was my first taste at passive income. So I'm like, all right, it's lit. It's, <laughs> <up>. <laughs> it's lit. So uh, three weeks later, I partnered with my friend who introduced me to the biz, and we bought a car uh, together. It wasn't cash. We financed it. And then from there, I just started buying more and more vehicles, utilizing strategic partnerships. I paid cash. I've done a lot of different strategies to acquire cars, but now we mainly just do it in our business name, typically with no money down. Mm. Yeah, for me, taking it taking it back, it's a crazy story, right? So I actually heard Brian on this podcast talking about <laughs> listen, talking about That's talking crazy. about rental cars. I'm like, yo, I'm over here just getting started in real estate, you know, still working my nine to five, looking for different streams. And I'm like, that sounds like a play. So Brian started doing the consulting. I'm like, all right, bet you consulting, bro, here. Here, take this, talk to me, let me know what's up, set the play up from there. Um, the first vehicle that I got was a 2018 Nissan Sentra. Um, we didn't know anything about financing at that point. We hadn't really unlocked the jewels. So I basically partnered up with a friend of mine and we uh, just bought it cash, bought it straight cash to start out. Then as we started getting more into the business, we started finding out these, these dealership tricks, these financing tricks, and that's how we was able to really scale quickly but that first drum was cash mm, see, i wanted to say because this is i think this is the first time on the episode we had somebody that heard the episode and got into the business has been on the episode. i just i think this is the first time, <laughs> the first time. yeah that's hard bro that's hard i'm like damn I, I didn't know that part i didn't know that part of the story i didn't know that at all i thought taking action bro yeah. that's, that's really what it is you you listen to information you hear information you got to take action yeah that's no you got to you got to Oh, yeah, I see you want to say something. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you because, like, of course, in order to scale, you got to have that financing in place. And that's something y'all both have mentioned. So mm -hmm. let's go deeper into that. So I know we got cash. I know we, you know, could do other means of creative finance. But can y'all break all those different methods of financing down for the people who may have one or two cars but are ready to move up to the next level? Yep. Yeah, for sure. So um, mainly, right, you have the traditional ways that you can buy a car, go into the dealership just getting financing in your personal name. You can also lease a car in your personal name. But what a lot of people don't know, you can actually do that same thing. If you have a business, you can do it in your mm -hmm. business name. You utilize something called a personal guarantee. That's really the, the, the trick to it. That's really where you go in there. You leverage your personal good credit, right? Same way you will qualify for a car regularly. You leverage your personal good credit, but except for they put the loan in your business name instead. This has a lot of key benefits, especially mm -hmm. for someone like, really both of us, we're, we're in real estate as well, right? So our debt to income ratio is extremely important. So we're able to scale up, buy these cars, still finance them with no money down. However, the notes that are, are on these cars and the actual debt, they don't appear on our credit score. Mm -hmm. That's really the main thing, right? So you have the commercial buying it in the business name. You can also lease it in the business name as well. We've experimented with all the different ways to do it. And after finding out this one, this one trick, it's no other. It's no other comparison to doing it that way <laughs> at all. Mm, that's, that's no, that's, I like that. No, that's dope. So, like, what do y'all think about this? Because I know um, this this industry right now, a lot of people is talking about a lot of people in the venture into it. So, do y'all think, from y'all in y'all opinions, is it the same amount of, of money that you can make right now as like previously? Mm -hmm. So I think it is. I think the, the biggest thing is running the numbers. Mm. Like if you're not running your numbers, you don't know what you're going to make, then you it's a recipe for the, the for disaster. I always tell people like it's really a numbers game. And me having an accounting background, obviously that's my lane. So I created this spreadsheet to really help people run those numbers and do that analysis. So we break everything down. We tell you uh, exactly how to compare 
your car with other vehicles to see how much you can rent it for every day. And then we typically um, say use 15 to 20 days per month um, as a metric to say this how much the vehicle is going to be rented. And from there, you can see how much income you're going to make every single month. But then you got to go deeper and look at the expenses as well, because we typically say five to ten percent every month for maintenance, depending on you know what vehicle you have, because right. you got a Tesla, it's, it really don't have any maintenance like that. So you really just paying for car washes. So you'll probably do like five percent. But if you have like a used vehicle, just like regularly, you can have some maintenance costs that can even to your cash flow. So you want to say ten percent. But then you have other fees like Turo and higher car costs. So they're going to charge you to use their platform. Right. So you got to take that into account as well. And based on the insurance plan that you select with these companies, you're either going to make, you know, 75 percent or you're going to make 60 percent of your income or whatever based on the insurance plan that you select. And then from there, you got your financing charges because you got to pay your loan every month unless you buy the vehicle cash. So we break all that down. But before we even do that, we make sure our students actually decide how much they need to make per month with this vehicle to make it worth it. It's right, like, if right, you don't right. have a target, what you aiming at, exactly. it's like you don't, you don't really know what you're going to do. So we make sure that you thoroughly analyze the numbers, but you can still run it up as yeah. long as you know what you're doing. Mm. So opportunities there. Yeah. Mm. Sure. So what's the longest, uh, from both of y'all, what's the longest y'all had like one car booked? Mine's was a year and a half. You got a problem? Yeah, <laughs> I a year and a half. It was a year and a half. How much? How much? How much was it? We made. Um, I think we made just under fifteen k <laughs> on that one rental. It was crazy because we bought the car for like eleven k, and I'm, man, this girl had that car. Like, why she, why she just ain't go buy a car? So she used it for Uber. She used oh, it for Uber. Okay, so okay. she was driving Uber. So she used to make money. So it's not like it was just coming out of her pocket every right, month. Right, right. It just came out of her. Uh, it was just one of her expenses. To make money on Uber, cause Boy, a year and a half. yeah, it was crazy. Listen, I ain't have no year and a half drawn. <laughs> I had crazy. I had one that was running out for about four and a half months. Okay, that's a long that's time. Still long. That's still, yeah. it's still good. It it that year and a half is crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. I bet you was mad as hell when she turned Man. that car. Man, you gonna come back and this car? Like, that's your like, car. It's that's yours. Good. I swear. Dang. So so, but people here, um, cause I always like I like touching on, with anything. I like touching on the pros and the cons of it. So dealing with this, you you. Mm -hmm means you're dealing with people when people yeah. you can never predict what people are gonna do so like if y'all have y'all have like any um horror stories when do, when dealing with this and like how did you deal with it man <laughs> so yeah with any investment it's really a lot of pros and cons so for this specifically what a lot of people don't realize or they do realize and they get a little afraid is that one your car can get stolen your car yeah. can get broken into a renter can damage the they can just damage the vehicle get into an accident like all these things have happened to me but it's really just a part of the business so one in one instance in chicago you know how chicago is mm -hmm. a renter literally you know it's in the winter you go in you start the car you, you leave the key in there somebody get in and pull off that happened to me like three different occasions <laughs> but we always got the car back because we have uh gps trackers in there okay. and, and shut off devices so that helps but it's just like it's just crazy just dealing with it at first when it first started happening man i ain't had a risk tolerance for it i ain't had a stomach for it so it was man i was sick but now it's just i know it's just a normal part of the business okay so now it's not really a horror story but at first it was it definitely was at first what about you bro yeah so that's actually a, a, a great point when it comes to the systems how they go with all of the horror stories right so for me I had this, I had this one chick, she was running, it was actually that four and a half month runner, right? So she, she did four and a half months and she extended by the day. So literally every day she just bought one more day and just kept buying one day at a time. At the end of the four and a half months ended abruptly because she just stopped, Stop stopped paying, stopped paying, mm. didn't holler at, at us at all, didn't call nobody. We calling her, nothing. So of course we have the system. So we go in, locate like, where, where is the car? Where is Shorty at? So she's, I'm in, I'm in Philly. She's over in Delaware doing who knows what. She's in Delaware, not contacting us. So we did what anybody would do in that situation. We killed the car, killed the car, waited an, another three, three, four hours, maybe like that. Then she finally called us like, hey, the car won't start. I'm like, yeah, yeah no, we know. Yeah. It won't start. <laughs> All right. We know. But um, so that happened. Then she, she wanted to like, can you turn the car on to, you know, have me go to the ATM so I can put money on my card so I can pay you for the day. I'm like, look, if you don't got the got the money, we can't keep playing cat and mouse like this. So the system shut off the car. We knew exactly where it was. Luckily, the car was on Toro. 
Toro has um, the benefit of if you need your car towed, they can actually go and tow it mm. and bring it right back to you mm. free of charge. But that's the benefit of knowing having the, the GPS in it. I'm like, all right, cool. It's in Delaware at this address. Toro, go ahead, just grab the car, bring it back to me. We're done with it. So it's a it's a it's a horror story because in that situation, you can do one of two things, right? You can you can panic and be like, oh shit, my car is gone. I don't know what, what to do. Or if you have the systems in place, all right, kill the car, locate the car, call up Toro. Tell him to go get it. Go get it. She yeah. thought it was her car. She, <laughs> she, she, she <laughs> swore it was her yeah. car. Yeah. So for um, so speaking of these systems, like how much does it cost to get these systems put into the car, and how expensive is it? Especially when you're trying to gauge like startup expenses. So when mm -hmm. you get your car, like how much would that be? It's relatively low. Um, so for the GPS and kill switch, it's a it's a combination device um, that costs about one hundred and twenty five dollars to purchase it, and it actually comes with. Um, the first two years of the service of er all the tracking services, $125 for that. I get mine installed at one of the like audio video places that costs about another hundred dollars to do. Um, then we go ahead and we automate. So we have a lockbox. We never mm -hmm. really meet our renters. Um, the lockbox costs about between 30 to $40, I yeah. believe something like that. Mm -hmm. um, those are really the main systems that you need to put in place to, to be able to protect to protect the car, everything else, you know, seat covers, mm -hmm. mats, things like that. Um, those are just everyday accessories, Conditions. but those specifically, that's really, that's really it as far as getting your, your, your systems set mm -hmm. up. Mm. So let me ask y'all this too, cause just on the same topic of protecting the car, let's talk insurance. Yeah. Cause I know yeah. like for y'all to have the car in this particular business, it's got to be, you know, something with the insurance to where it's going to cost more than a normal, like, um, the normal policy. So can y'all dive into that? Like, what does that conversation look like with the insurance company? And then just what are some of those things you have to add on to the policy to make sure that car is protected? Yeah. So we use commercial insurance. And a lot of people would think that it's way more expensive, but it's not. So we use this specific product by this company called ABI. I think it's mm -hmm. American Business Insurance. And they have a specific product for ride sharing. It's called Period X, okay. and it's way cheaper than you would think. Like, I just I just bought a Tesla, and literally, my monthly payment is $67 a month for the insurance. It's like, you buy a car personally, put it in your name, you're going to be paying probably triple that, mm -hmm. if, if not more. So it's very low cost. So we always tell people, use commercial insurance, put it in your business name, and then you don't got to worry about it. But if you don't know that and you just go to, you know, an all state or something of the source, like you're going to be paying way more. Uh, you have to add on, you know, the ride share protection and all of that. They're going to charge you even more on top of what you're going to already be paying. Right. So that's why it's just important that you have that information. But yeah, if you out there and you want to start your rental car business, make sure you get commercial insurance. Go ahead and get that period X policy and you'll be good. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, the ride share platforms, they have their own insurance too. Mm -hmm. So in reality, you typically never use your personal insurance. And that's probably why that commercial insurance product is so cheap because they know that you probably will never use it because it's either going to be protected by hire car or Turo, or if they're using the vehicle for Uber and Lyft, then Uber and Lyft is going to, their insurance is going to cover it. Mm -hmm. So. That's how it works. Is the Tesla for personal use or ride sharing? Both. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. So I always wanted, to, I always wanted a Tesla. So I'm gonna rent it out uh, for a couple, a couple days a month. It's gonna pay the note, and then mm -hmm. I'm gonna get to enjoy it the rest of that time, and still gonna cash flow. So easy. Yeah, that's easy money. Yeah. That's gonna get rented. Yeah, oh, yeah especially yes. in a major city like Chicago. And so, how are y'all like? Um, when you decide on the car to buy, like, is it a certain price point, a certain style of car model, or mm -hmm. like, what's what's the determining factors for those things? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So um, really, when you think about a car that's going to go, right, we actually have a uh, software car sync. So we're actually able to go into whatever market it is that we're in and actually look and see what the most popular cars are in that area on the Toro platform. So once you do that, you know exactly what's going to hit. You know what I'm saying? Like in, in, in Philly, Tesla Model 3 is the top car. It was a no-brainer for me to go and get that, go and, and get <laughs> go that get car. Because right. I know, one, I want to drive a Tesla. And two, I know it's going to rent. Um, there's Nissan, Nissan Sentras as well. But once you, once you utilize the technology, right, you want to be able to really do analytics on everything that you do. You want to know your market. You want to study your market. And you want to purchase the vehicles that are going to hit in your market. And I know just as a standard, we're going into it, you want to just think about 
what do people look for when they're running a car, right? First and foremost, Bluetooth, right? You know you want to get a car that at least got some Bluetooth in it so everybody can listen to their music. You want to get something that has a backup camera, people can't drive. You want to, <laughs> you want to get something that has a backup camera so it's, it is going to lessen the risk, the uh, likelihood of them getting in an accident in the, in the vehicle. So I look for those modern technologies in the car. Um, and then from there, I utilize technology. What is hidden in my, what is hidden in my market? And I'm going after those vehicles specific, specifically. Mm. Take the guesswork out of it. Because mm. mm -hmm. I've, I've seen some people that uh, like go strictly out to like luxury vehicles, like Lambos mm -hmm. and Rarys and that kind of shit. I'm like, I'm pretty sure they 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 getting a lot of money per day, but then they it costs so much more to purchase them. So mm -hmm. it kind of probably like evens itself out to what y'all could be doing. At least that's that's for how, I, how I've seen it at least. So I don't know for sure though. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it really depends on like who your ideal, uh, like what is your target market? Because I know for us. We're just targeting everyday people. We're not trying to focus on, you know, those high earners high that earners, want to drive, right. you know, those particular vehicles. But if that was our market, I'm sure there's ways to just make that profitable. But, um, yeah, you really just got to figure out what you're trying to do and then just go after that. But mm. the luxury, I think the luxury market is very, very lucrative, too. But I personally don't do that. Yeah. And it's also going to be dependent yet. on your location, mm. right? Because... I'm in Philly. He's in Chicago. You don't see people riding around in Lambos every single no. day. You feel me no. at all? But if you're in somewhere, Miami, Miami Atlanta, Atlanta yeah. LA, that's way more likely mm -hmm. to be able to hit every single day because you're in that market. So knowing where you at, you at? is very important. Yeah, mm, that's, that's a fact. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so George, I wanna well, it's for both of you, but. I want to know, like, how hands-on do you have to be with the rental car business? Because I know you still have your 9-to-5, and you're managing your business on the side, and you at one point still had yours mm -hmm. and was doing both. So, I mean, what does the day-to-day -day look like? Like, how hands-on do you need to be with it? Yeah, so it really is going to depend on if you're going into the business alone or if you're leveraging partnerships. So for me, knowing that I have a 9-to-5, all of my vehicles are leveraged through partnerships. So what I take care of on the day-to-day -day basis probably takes about – depending on the week, maybe three to five hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really just, I am boots on the ground. So my partners take care of all the electronic communications, anything like that on the back end. And I just take care of literally just taking the car to the car wash, um, setting the lockbox code and making sure it's, it's, it's in this spot and taking my pictures. That's really, that's really it. When the way that we have the business set up with having lockboxes in place, having virtual check-in in, in place, it's not taking a lot of time out of my day. I can literally do it. I'm at my job, work, working from home has been clutch, right? But mm -hmm. I'm at my job, I can take five minutes, go get the car ready for the next runner, take my pictures and I'm good to go. I do that between all of those vehicles. It's usually taking me about like three or five hours okay. each week. Not, not yeah, bad at, not all. That ain't yeah. at all. Yeah, that ain't nothing. Yeah, it's really not time intensive. Like it probably take me about three to five hours too. I don't do a lot of the car washes and things, the, things like that no more. I just really let the automations do that. And I have partners that they'll go take the car wash. They'll go get the oil change. They'll do, you know, all the 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 things that you really have to do and just be in person. But other than that, you know, I really just be chilling, honestly. Uh, <laughs> but when they're not available, because a lot of my partners, they be having nine to fives. Like, I'll go ahead and I'll get the car wash and I'll set it up. But that's literally a 30-minute process for right. one vehicle. But if you have a ton going out that day, then obviously it's going to take a little bit longer. But yeah, it really doesn't take it, it doesn't take a ton of time. But it really depends on how you run your business too, because some people they offer like delivery to you know let's say you rent a car and you want it to be delivered to you. Okay, now that you're taking a little bit more time out your day, depending on how far you got to travel. So if you're doing things like that, you can spend a little bit more time in the business. But all in all, like it's mostly passive for sure. Mm, what about storage? Like yeah. when you have so many cars, you got nine, you got ten. Like what do you guys um like? park them if they're not being used yeah but for me i utilize free parking on the street in chicago <laughs> <laughs> honestly like i don't want to pay for it but it's a lot of ways you can spend it because i know it's a lot of like mom and pop shops with um they'll have they'll have parking and their parking is never full so a lot of times what we'll do i know george has done this out in philly we'll go talk to the owner pay them you know 20 to 100 dollars a month and you can park their cars there okay. if you don't have you know secure parking or anything like that or free parking around the way oh well, yeah i just utilize free parking in chicago same same yeah i uh leverage 
free parking on the, on the street. And then recent recently, um, at a little bar right down the street from my house, I just spoke with the owner. Like, hey, I know that there's not a lot of cars here. You got these these spots. Can I give you a couple dollars every single month? I have cars here that are maybe here once or twice a month, just sitting in the parking lot. People gonna come grab them. It's a no brainer for him. I need a couple parking spots. He gets a couple dollars. Everybody wins. Yeah, yeah everybody wins. That's, yeah, that's easy, man. Because I know that's probably something that people worry about, especially when you start building a fleet. Yeah. It's like where you where to keep your vehicles at that you can actually trust that nobody's going to do some bullshit or nothing mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, that's that's good info right there. And regarding, like, because I know, uh, I think we said this before we started, this is your first time, like, linking up in person. So, like, how did this connection, where did it, how did it start? Like, where did it come from and all that good stuff? Yeah, so I, w I ran the business uh, for uh, for about a year and a half, you know, teaching people how to get into the rental car industry. Mm -hmm. And then I saw how well George was doing, but he was kind of taking the financing to another level. So he taught me a ton of things, not just with not just specific to the rental car industry, but with business credit and things of that nature. So it was really a no brainer. It's like we could partner up and we can do this thing together. He has the element of the financing, you know, he has a finance background. So, and then I'm running the numbers and I already got the systems in place and we just kind of just put our heads together. Cause there was a lot of people out there that took my course and they just went out on their own teaching and things of that nature. And he was always that affiliate that was just going crazy, always very supportive. So it was really just like a no brainer. Cause we was basically already working together, but he was just an affiliate, but then brought him on and it's just been bliss from there. But it's crazy because, like you said, it's our first time meeting in person, right. and we didn't ran up some some <laughs> nice numbers since we started <laughs> two months right. ago. That's yeah. Only two months, huh? yeah, it's only yeah. been yeah, two, what, yeah, two months. Yeah, right? like two months. We two started months. in July, started planning in June, but you know, relaunched the course in July, revamped it, and we done pretty well. But yeah, it's crazy. We just made sure we had you know our operating agreement in place and all right. that stuff because. The internet's a scary place, man. People be getting scammed. <laughs> but <Man. laughs> this been man, solid. What? It's been solid. That's what's up, man. That's, I, I, uh, I love to see things like that. But you talking about, like, courses, though. People taking courses, taking the info, creating their own. Like, as somebody that's listening to this that may be thinking about starting a course or maybe dealing with that, like, how can they handle that? Like, obviously, you, it's important for you to copyright your stuff and yeah. all that. But what's other things that they can do to prevent other people just – Buying their course, taking their info, and just making their own. Yeah, I mean, all you really can do is copyright. Like, yeah. we got a copyright disclaimer in there, but people people still going to do it. But it's like, it's up to you if you want to spend your money to buy that course to then send that to your, to your lawyer and get their stuff taken down. Like, you can do <laughs> it, but it's just like... At first, um, at first I used to do that, but now it's just like I don't really care as much. I just I try to focus because I know giving energy to that stuff is is only gonna take energy away from the things that's most important to me. But I can I can you can do that though. So don't think that you can't do it. Don't think that it's petty to do it because it's really not. Because at the end of the day, it's an ethics thing. Exactly. But you realize a lot of people don't have ethics. Man, like, the ethics is money. Money, that's it. <laughs> that's that's it. all I care that's about. All. If it's, it's going to be a check ball, nothing else matters. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, that's a fact. Something I want to ask you guys, because I see like just from, well, of course, knowing you, Brian, but looking at both y'all's social media pages, y'all are strong advocates of financial literacy. So I want to get y'all pretty much advice to the listeners. Like if I came to you and I was like, Brian, George, you know, I'm pretty much, I got bad credit. I have no money saved and I'm trying to pull myself up and get to a point where I am doing well financially. What would be the best advice you would give me? Man, I would say, first of all, you just like how I was, you know, when I, when I graduated college, even though I had an accounting background, I was actually like in financial literacy, a part of a financial literacy group teaching financial literacy across campus, but I wasn't practicing what I preached. So when I graduated, I had, you know, bad credit. My credit score was like a 570 when I graduated. Um, I had student loan debt that I shouldn't have had because I used all my student loans and I shouldn't have, I didn't even have to. Um, and I had credit card debt. So the first thing that I would recommend is you really got to realize where your financial habits came from. Mm. Because a lot of people, they don't even take a step back to reflect and understand that. And a lot of times, you know, all they're doing is repeating the same mistakes that their mothers, fathers, aunties, cousins, uncles, mm -hmm. whatever. Everybody in their family or their friends, they just rubbed off on them and you're just repeating those same mistakes. So you really got to stop back, understand where those habits came from forgive yourself and then you got to really reprogram your financial blueprint because 
you you really don't have a financial identity until you actively decide to make that decision. So then from there, you got to educate yourself. You really mm-hmm. got to educate yourself. Like you got to do that legwork. You got to read the books. You got to, you know, mm-hmm. take courses if you want to go that route. But, you know, I read some great books like Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, The Richest Man in Babylon, The Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, Aisha Seldon's book, Bees's book. Um, I read a ton of books and that really helped. But then you just got to be disciplined. Like you got to know where your money is going. You got to budget. And then once you get all that under control, you get your emergency fund in place, like then that's when it starts to really, you know, take those next steps towards investing. Mm -hmm. But it all starts with, you know, making that first decision and then just following through with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think same thing when I got out of when I got out of out of school, student loans are there. Right. Just now starting the corporate corporate gig. So trying to get everything together. I think the first step that we have to take in that in that journey is really looking at your money and understanding, all right, where is where is the fat? Like where am I wasting where am I wasting money at? Really taking a hard look, look at your bank account, print out the last three months of bank statements. Oh. You won't you <laughs> look at yourself you in, in the in the mirror. It's going it's gonna hurt. Yeah. You, you're gonna be like, damn, I spent that much at the liquor store, I spent this much at fast food. When you really want a certain lifestyle, you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror. Take responsibility, understand that that money is going out and understand that that's your freedom right there. All that mm-hmm. money that's going out, every single dollar is your freedom. And if you really take that mindset in every single thing that you do mm-hmm. and you stop wasting that money, then you be then you now have something of, you know, tangible value that you can now go out, invest in, invest in, in some stocks, things like that to really mm-hmm. start, you know, building yourself up. But we got to look at ourselves in the mirror because I know I looked up one day. I looked, I literally looked at my bank statements and I'm like, wow, I'm wasting about $600 every single month on just nothing. Mm-hmm. And then I, from that day forward, cut that out. Now that's $600 of, you know, disposable income that I can now make moves with and just continue to build. So that's the first step for sure. Yeah, mm. I, I actually had went through that because it was like probably two years ago. I wasn't really on checking my account that much. I was just like, whatever. But when I realized it, I started looking. It was at least like $400 worth of unnecessary subscriptions yeah. I had coming out. And I downloaded the app Truebill. And now I check it like every day. Mm-hmm. And I categorize all my spending. I know where all the money is going, going. And it shows me like from going months back where, you know, these are your highest spending or highest spending categories or you've spent more than normally. So I definitely, I'm a strong advocate of keeping track of that. And yeah. I do have one more question for I let Zay ask no, I was going to say, you gave Truebill a plug like they gave us a check. Like. <laughs> I mean, my bad, but yeah, I mean. hey. Do hey, two bill hollers. You see this hollers. <laughs> do what y'all want with it. But um, y'all both went to college, and now y'all both in a business where you don't need a college education to be in this business, and y'all doing well in that business. Looking back, do y'all regret regret going to college? Like, do you think it was worth it? So, when you go to college, you got to know what you're what you're going for. For myself, I never, I don't think college would have is necessary especially mm-hmm. in today's today's day and age there's so much information available to us for me personally college was a time for me to develop character mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. coming out of coming out of coming out of, out of high school i didn't have my head on all the way so i needed those years to be around people who are you know focused on whatever it is that they want to do in life be around a different environment right get out of the small town in new jersey where everybody's doing the same thing go to a completely different different place and then just start over i think that exposure was really the benefit of college for me. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much the education, because I can't I can't think of one thing that I actually <laughs> used that I like learned in college now, but it was just that exposure and the change of mindset that really helped me to level up. That's what mm-hmm. I used school for. Yeah, I definitely don't regret it, man. College was crazy. It was crazy good, man. All the growth that I experienced. I know when I got to when I got to college, like I wasn't confident. I really like self confidence. I you know I I sucked at communicating. Like that was one of my pitfalls. And really investing in all of my professional and personal development during college, being exposed to all of the professional development that they give you, man, it was just crazy. And then just being involved in all the organizations. Cause I was in, I was involved in about seven organizations, Damn. met a ton of dope people. And it's just like, like he said, that exposure is just crazy. And I networked with my professors too. Like they helped me get internships making, well, I was making more than I ever did while being, you know, a college student 
for those couple of months during the summer. So yeah, I definitely don't regret college, but it really depends on where you are when you come out of high school, I think, because uh, there's so many lanes that you can go into. Like we see now people in high school, they be making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a mm-hmm. month right. if they're focused and they just go after what they desire. But I think that's, I think a lot of people, they really don't know when they that young. Mm-hmm. But those people who, who know and they, uh, they just going crazy with it from a very young age, I think they're an anomaly. Like, yeah. there's very few that can do that. So I would definitely recommend going to college or yeah. just figuring out a lane that you want to go, go into that's not college. You can go to a trade. You can do a ton of different things, but you got to know what you want to do. Yeah, you got to know what you – you, you got you to gotta have some awareness too because, mm-hmm. like you said, it might not be for everybody, but then at the end of the day, a lot of people still need it, especially yeah. for that development. But I like something that uh, George said earlier. When, like, a lot of stuff that you spoke on, it boiled down to, like, accountability and – like accountability, you know, that could be a hard pill to swallow for people to for them to look at themselves, be honest with themselves, and say, mm-hmm. "Damn, I'm I'm fucking up. Let, mm-hmm. uh, let me try to get my stuff together." But a lot of people they don't do that until it all falls down. Yeah. Like it's at the bottom of the bottom when they ain't got no other option. Mm-hmm. I was like, "All right, let me be real with myself." And it's like you could have did that when you first seen some some fallbacks. You could have yeah. did that then yep. and just corrected it. But like you said, a lot of people just. That's a hard pill to swallow, especially when you were um, still young, you know what I'm saying? Because we all still relatively young. Like, people see this, watch stuff like this, and it look like like everything perfect, but we still make mistakes. Like, you know what I'm saying? We ain't, when you 50, you make mistakes, but us, you are you in your 20s still? Yeah, 27. So, see, all us here, you in your 20s still yeah, too, right? Yeah, 27 too. Yeah, see, look, we all in our 20s. So, what's your, I already, yeah. <laughs> you laughing, she about to say, I know what she's about to say. You the oldest person in here. I know she's about to I know Deanna, man. I know Deanna. That's why she's laughing. She's like, you the oldest, I know, I know. You know my mind. No, nah, but we all, like, we all, um, like people, people might be seeing it, especially you know people look at us. They be like, "Damn, they made it. they where I want to be at." And I know, like, yo, we go through a lot of shit too yeah. to keep to especially to keep going. This shit ain't no like we ain't have no blueprint to to live in this the way we like mm-hmm. living and excelling. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. All this is like trial and error. Cause yeah. you from Philly, I'm pretty sure nobody was putting y'all on crazy game, and I'm pretty sure you went through a lot of trial and error to get to where you at. Yeah, so. It's, it, it's, it's funny, right? So for myself, I actually, we think about generational wealth. So my parents are real estate investors, right? So I was oh, actually, shit. I was actually raised listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, going to all the, the, the Donald Trump <laughs> seminars and everything like that. I've been going to them since I can remember. Like that was what my childhood wow. was. But here's the thing, when we talk about what we're building and actually being able to change the culture, Right, I had I had that exposure, but I was a I was a damn knucklehead, like all the way on the, on the other side. But I just had this this background because my parents forced me to, right? And I think now I'm I'm at a point where everything that I had in my childhood that was kind of like force fed to me, I hated it growing up. Like I'm I, I can I'm in in high school, right? In high school, I used to be in damn rental properties with my pops putting up ceiling fans fixing electric electric outlets while while my homies is outside playing basketball or whatever. I'm like, yo, I like I'm not trying to do this right now. <laughs> right. But he like, yo, you gonna thank me. You gonna thank me later. And that was how once it clicked, once it actually clicked in my head, that's how I was able to turn up quickly. Because once we have that once we have that background, you're able to leverage it. And I think what we're doing now, people that are able to see things like this happen that's the first that's the first step right Lay, laying the actual seed and shit i can't even tell you where our kids are, are going to be at right because mm-hmm. every if, if we do it correctly and we share the information every every generation just kind of builds off of that yeah. yeah so i think like i i like to think of myself as actually like that in fruition because i'm lucky enough to actually have folks who my folks literally found real estate from a, an infomercial on, on TV late at night and was just like, yo, we gonna try this. And I, I just happened to, I was there, you feel me? I was, I was the only kid still there. So they was like, yo, we don't got no babysitter, so you gotta come with us as we try this. And I got to see them actually build up their real estate portfolio. Mm-hmm. So to me, I always knew, I think that was a, that was a little bit why I was a, I, w- I was a bit of a knucklehead because I'm in school, they teach me geometry and stuff. I'm like, yo, like, why don't you just buy some rental properties? Like, what are y'all talking about right now? <laughs> like, what are y'all that's talking the about? They're like, that's not the subject. That's not- <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was a, um, 
it was a crazy, crazy benefit to to have that for yeah, sure. That's amazing, man. And you know, mm-hmm. technology is advancing so fast. I like, in my opinion, I think if you're not hipping your kids to game and doing certain things that your parents deal with, this next generation, I think it's gonna be like they're going to be at a, a real bad position because I don't think jobs are going to be as available with the advancement of tech. Yeah, and it's right. easy. It's like, this is the easiest time in history to become a millionaire. Like, I, I read yesterday that it's 17, mil, it's 17 million millionaires in America. So I'm like, it's, if it's 17 million millionaires in America, I looked up how many people in America. And they say it's like 333 million people. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's pretty much one in every, tw- tw- every, one in every 20 person in America is a millionaire. Right. That don't... Now, when you hear that, it don't sound far-fetched at all. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you got 20 people in the room, odds are at least one of them in that room are a millionaire. So you knowing that math shows you how possible it is. And in my belief, I think within the next 10, 20, 25 years, it's going to be much more higher because a millionaire is going to be such a common thing. Mm -hmm. So, but like I'm saying, if you're not helping your people, I don't think jobs will be as available. And I think a lot of people are going to be in bad, real bad um, predicaments if they don't try to get their shit right right now because it's the mm-hmm. perfect time to get it together. Like, y'all doing several he- income streams in t- at 27 years old. Like, our parents, I know my parents, they ain't even know, like, this was possible. Yeah. This would be possible. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. The internet changed changed everything for us. It made it so much it's so much easier. But I want to ask y'all this. Out of all the income streams y'all got, I like, I love ask, asking this question. You know what I'm saying? Y'all in real estate. Y'all got courses, you know what I'm saying? I got rental cars. You still at your nine to five. Who knows what other income streams y'all got? So what is y'all absolute favorite? If y'all can only pick one, what's y'all favorite income mm. stream? That's a good question. I say for me, I think it might be the digital space. That's probably like a, courses. That's probably the favorite because um, you get to impact other people. But I love real estate too. So it'd be like those are probably the top two. But I take the digital space because it's just easier and you can see the impact in real time. Or is it real estate? Like once you sell that building, uh, like because I've been doing a lot of flips lately, I don't get to see you know the owner move the in. Owner I don't even in. go to the closing, so I don't even get to you know see them get the keys, anything like that. Um, so yeah, I would say the digital space and then real estate. Yeah, the digital space for sure. The, when you're able to actually sit there, create something, and then you see the impact that it has on so many other people, not to mention there's nothing as passive as just getting a, a notification on your phone that I somebody's... Just, I literally just got one two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I brought it up. I'm like, let me ask them this. <laughs> Listen, man, there's, 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 nothing, there's nothing like that, right? From I mean, second is definitely the real estate, and it all kind of goes together. You create your own like ecosystem, right? Like the, the digital space, the money that, that gets from there, we can dump that into real estate and you know so on and so forth. But with, with real estate, like Brian said, one, you don't get that that same uh, satisfaction of the the end the end product, right? Impacting somebody else. And two, on the rental on the rental side, listen, tenants is tenants is a trip, man. Like, <laughs> tenants is a is a is a damn is a damn trip. Yeah. Just having to deal with someone else all the time. Mm. Um, it's a headache that in, in, in the digital space and look, you, you giving somebody their housing, um, but you don't get that. You don't get that. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Every single time that you no, talk, that wears off very quickly, man. Yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> quickly. Very quickly. Especially when you talk about your own property in um, states that aren't landlord friendly. Mm-hmm. That's what makes it a whole nother mm-hmm. headache. You know what I'm saying? They want to decide, you know, all these, these with COVID, all the stuff they got in place now where, some places you ain't even got to pay rent for real. Ain't mm-hmm. nothing as the owner that you can do about that. Mm-hmm. So that creates a whole nother, uh, <laughs> a whole nother. Like we on the last episode, I used to say one of her friends ran to somebody crib. Yeah, I with a strap. <laughs> I believe it. Up. Like pulled up. Like where my money at? I need that. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's. I mean, we didn't. We've seen a lot of stories over these past couple of months of that of that happening. Like there was a story in, in Vegas. Like. Like three people died from that exact situation. Right. Yeah, <laughs> the, the the landlord was like, "Yo, I need my bread," and they wasn't paying him, so he he shot everybody in there. And that's <laughs> that's that's real life, and wow. we have to understand it's like wild. it's it's wild. literally wild. crazy. But like it's, you 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 push people to the to the brink. As somebody who's an, an independent landlord, the government comes out and says that all right, cool, because of this, you just don't have to pay rent, you and you have, have the tenant that does that. As a landlord, I'm like, well, my mortgage is still due. Mm-hmm. Mortgage what you, still due. Who what you pay mean? These bills? Yeah, mm-hmm. somebody got paid, or you gotta go. And if mm-hmm. and if nobody's gonna help me in the court to do it, I can't. Yeah. I can't say I don't understand people doing it. 
you know, taking it into their own hands because they're at the end of the day, they're they're desperate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's somebody that we know. I ain't gonna say his name. He he sent me a message of him talking to one of his tenants, and I'm it's, when I read, and I was reading, I'm like, oh, this is wild. So he t- <laughs> he texted his tenant. He was like, hey, I'm just reaching out to collect the rent for this month. I've sent multiple um, emails. Look like you guys may have missed it. <laughs> she, she replied, we didn't miss it. We simply just don't have it. I told you last month we didn't have it. Nothing nothing has changed. So stop. So, no, nothing has changed for this month. So you can stop asking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 so he said, he said, uh, so just to confirm. <laughs> yeah. He said, so just to confirm, y'all not paying rent this month. And she said, no, maybe next month. <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> what? So when he sent me that, I'm like, man, yo, like stuff like this. I'm like, because people, you know, people see real estate, they just think it's, you know, you're going to get your property, it's sweet, you're going to be making money. And a lot of times that is the case. But then a lot of times at the same time, like I said, at the end of the day, when you're dealing with people, it's so many things that you can't predict. Yeah, yeah. And so many circumstances you can't predict, predict. And a lot of BS getting involved. I think the most important thing is just having your systems in place and all that good stuff mm-hmm. so you can... Cause have y'all been have y'all dealt with any like evictions? I haven't. I have. How'd it go? It went. It went, it went good. You have to know what, what you're doing. <laughs> listen, listen. So um, I have evicted one tenant, and it just so happened to be my first ever like real tenant. So my my business actually started in real estate first with property management. So I was managing properties for other people because, like I said, I've been I was doing it for a long time. So I'm like, all right, I can do this for other people and actually get a bag from it. And then when I bought my first property, did all the due diligence on this lady, everything, and then I don't know what happened. She just she lost it. She stopped paying. She stopped paying her rent at the end. We had to get we had to evict her. But here's the thing: when you know your processes and when you do your due diligence and understand the, the court system, you will end up okay in the long run. But man, that's the importance of reserves in, in real estate. Yeah. Reserves are crazy because that woman went. Three, three or, or four months without paying any rent. If I didn't have reserves, it was over. You would be done. Mm-hmm. It was over. Because mortgage still got to get paid. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But they they have something called a judgment, right? So you can get you can literally take a tenant to court. You can get a judgment for the money, and then um, how it works. This property was in Jersey, so how it works is you can either uh, garnish their wages, or you can actually have the state levy their bank account and go in and just take the assets. So she she. Ended up getting evicted, moving out of the house. That three, four months of rent was just gone. I got a judgment for her, and I collected that three, four months of rent over the next year and a half. Every single paycheck, every every single time she got paid, they took a little bit out of her paycheck and sent it to us in the mail. So wow. I still got all my money, but that's the point of having them reserves because I got over the next year and a half. Damn. I want to um, take it back to the um, to the car business for a second. So, say I'm, I'm someone that's listening to this, and I've been thinking about getting into the industry. So, this is a perfect like man, it's perfect time for me to see this episode. Let's say I got ten to fifteen thousand dollars to play with to enter the industry. Let's say my credit score is decent. So, if that was y'all in that situation, and you want and you want to use this to get into the car rental space, how would you utilize that money to get into the game? Yeah. I wouldn't even count on spending all that money. Honestly, what I would do is I would leverage that credit score and I would get commercial financing. And then uh, we got this play where, you know, BOA, they will give you multiple auto loans with one inquiry. So you can get up to like four cars at one time just to start. And if you play it right, you can do it with no money down. Because a lot of times what they'll do is they'll finance 105 to 110% of the value of the vehicle. So not only will it cover the cost of the vehicle, it'll cover your taxes, it'll cover your title, it'll cover, you know, all the additional fees and sales tax and the things of that nature. So with that, we had a lot of students that's been running that play and they'll just get four at one time. And the only thing they're paying for up front, they're paying for uh, the lockbox. They're paying for the, um, they're paying for, you know, the GPS and shut off devices. And then uh, maybe they'll get the mats and things of that nature. So literally for, you know, to get started doing that no money down route, you can get four cars and you'll pay maybe like five to seven hundred dollars just to get all those GPS stars 
install, get all your lock boxes, and then you good to go. Right. So now you still got you know fourteen thousand left to do whatever you want, and you just created four different income streams. So that's exactly what I would tell them to do. That's really Damn. the play. Damn, you just hey. That's Drop a bomb. He just gave it a play for real. Mm-hmm. That's the play right there for real. Yeah. So, for pe- so and uh, I know y'all have the um, a course together as well. So, for the people that's that uh, interested in getting that, what does all that detail? What would they learn? All that good stuff. Man, uh, everything. Right, you're able to actually leverage and even talking about the play that that we just that we just talked about with how our students are able to skyrocket from their rip right now. You're able to learn from experience. Right. You're able to learn from people who have been through multiple accidents, cars getting cars getting stolen. Right. Every single time something bad happens, you have to learn from it. You have to create a system that is going to be able to fix that. And then you, you leverage that system. That's really what the course in, entails. Right. You're going to you're going to get all of the ways to finance the car. What's the best way for your situation? Um, how to automate, how to automate. We have systems in place now where we don't even have to talk to the renters. Every, we have a, a touch point that touches base with the renter five different times during their trip, automated, right? A straight machine machine does it. So you're literally going to get all of our systems from start to finish, how to start the business, how to get everything together, go through your checklist of all the materials you need, how to run the business, right? Everyday, everyday operations, what pictures to take, what to put it in, in your description. And then, bro, everything. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> literally, literally, Everything is is in there. I think we see it from when this has launched to two months ago now. People are literally able to take that information step by step and launch a business that's making them four or five thousand dollars in their first month of starting. Yeah. It's it's everything you need in one place. Yeah, that's why we call it the blueprint. Cause like I know when I was getting started, man, I went through so much trial and error. Like I mentioned, stolen vehicles, cars crashing. At first, I didn't even have GPS trackers. Like I went through a lot. So I wanted people, you know, starting this business to really be stress free and really to take the, you know, take the thinking out of it. You really just follow and you just follow the blueprint and you will be good. Like all the risk mitigation, we cover all of that. Um, we just try to give so much game because it's so tough starting a new venture. Exactly. Like when you start a new venture, you got so many questions. Mm-hmm. Like it could go wrong. It can go downhill real fast. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, in their courses, they don't give everything. So right. you always have, you know, those follow up questions or you just learn by experience. Um, yeah, you just learn by experience, but experience costs money. Man, it costs time. Yep. So, yeah, we just try to lay it all out and make it just e- as easy as possible for people. Mm. And that's the dope thing about, uh, in my opinion, paying for um, somebody else's experiences because you get to skip the hurdles and the mistakes they made. Instead mm-hmm. of you having to go through it, you could just say, oh, this what, this what Brian, this what George did that it didn't work out for them. Now I know not to do this. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, people, I think a lot of, like, we in the era right now, a lot of people, they comfortable with paying for information. What's up, D? No. <laughs> you look, you, look, you want to say something? question. You go ahead. Oh, my bad. My <laughs> no, bad. go ahead. <laughs> no, you good. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just want to add just real quick. Because um, I know just like with real estate, like with the rental car business, I'm sure people can get over leveraged. Mm. And it can go real south if you right, get right, over leveraged. Right. So what advice would you give to someone who may end up in a position where they are over leveraged and they're trying to find the best way to navigate that and get right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I had a couple of people hit me up saying, "Oh, I bought this car. My car note was way too high. Um, my interest rate was like fifteen percent, and now I can't afford the vehicle. I'm not making any money." And I'm like, "Well, did you run the numbers? <laughs> did you use the spreadsheet? No, I didn't use it." I'm like, "Oh, come on." So the first thing I would tell you, like, man, you gotta have reserves. Um, but now is the perfect time to sell off that vehicle. Because nine times out of 10, you know, if you bought it a, a year ago, two years ago, whatever it is, you're probably going to get exactly what you pay for. it. So if you made a little bit of money, you know, during that time, then not only you got that profit, but you're going to profit again from selling the vehicle because I'm sure it paid down over the last year. So I would tell them to get rid of it and start fresh. But this time, make sure you run the numbers <laughs> because it happens. You know, the crazy thing about courses is only 7% of people, I think I read... Only 7% of people actually finish the course. Finish the course, right. And then, you know, out of that, who, who knows how many actually take action um, and actually utilize everything in the course. What we found is sometimes, you know, people will take the course and they'll ask a million questions before they even go through it. It's like you're not even, you don't, you don't even really want to do it. 
So I know some people, um, they really need that self-awareness, man. Like, mm-hmm. you really got to understand who you are and if you're really going to jump into this business. So before we get into any of the information, of course, we ask you exactly what your why is. And we make you write it down. Because that's so, it's so, so important. Because that why is, that's what's going to keep you going. But if you don't got that why, like, it's easy for, you know, a disaster to happen. Right. And you can just throw it all away. Like, we had one of our students, Phil, I think he's he's somewhere in Texas. I forget where. But literally, his first rental, first renter, first car, literally total. Vehicle total. Luckily, you yeah, know, first, he had... The first renter. First renter. Not just the first car, the first renter. First renter, bro. It was crazy. I never heard it. I never heard of that happening. So... Total, luckily, he got all his money back because he had gap insurance and things of that nature. So it was fine, but he kept pushing because he had a Y. He right. kept pushing, and now he has, I think he had like eight or nine vehicles now. Yeah, um, and that's And Scale. he works with his wife. like So they're a team, and they just manage the vehicles. Um, but like... If he didn't have a why, like... He would have stopped. Yeah, he would have stopped. So, like I, know, I probably would have stopped that. And to me, yeah. I ain't even going to lie to you. Uh, so, yeah, it's very important to have that why, but it's very important to run the numbers, man. And don't be, don't be, don't be greedy, right? Like, I think so many people, they get into this industry. It's a very high cash flow industry, right? You put your car on the platform, and you're going to start making money instantly. Mm-hmm. But we got to understand, like, I'm a financial advisor, so I always tell all of... all. All of my clients, everything. Look, before you're even investing in anything, you need to make sure you have your emergency fund Mm -hmm. set up. It's the same thing with with business. So as soon as you start making money in your rental car business, don't start spending it. Don't get greedy. Don't just, Mm -hmm. you know, start start blowing it. Make sure I say for every single car that you have, there needs to be at least a three to six month reserve for that for that vehicle before you take any profit from yeah. your business at all, build your reserve. If you have some cash set aside, though, go ahead, put the cash in there as the reserve, and then you can start taking your cash flow. But if not, listen, run the play, stack up your reserves, and that way, if there is a rainy day, if there is a slowdown for a month, you at least know that you're covered, you you know, did it correctly, got your reserves up, and that is able to mitigate you know, that, that bad situation from happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for- uh, I was going to say, for those that are wondering, like, for the reserves, man, all you're doing is adding up your car note, adding up your insurance payment, and then multiplying that by right. three to six months, and then that's how you're going to get how much that emergency fund should be for that individual vehicle. Mm. But, yeah, that's that's super important. I'm glad you said that. So I got a question. It may be a little wild, but no, it's Lord, where, where is it going? Where, <laughs> but, where is it going? <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to know, like, so let's say somebody do have one of your cars, and it does get totaled, and Lord forbid you experience a casualty, is there any liability on you guys with that situation? Mm, or is no. it just on a driver? It's typically on the driver. Uh, I never experienced it where it would be on us. Well, I never experienced a casualty, period, but I've had, had vehicles that that are total, but it never really falls back on us. Um, that's where insurance kind of comes in place. But you gotta make sure that you have, you know, the right insurance that's covering, you know, the right amount of limits because uh, mm-hmm. you can get into an instance where let's say it's a three or four car pile up and the fault is on you know another driver they may not have they never have they may not have the insurance coverage to actually cover everybody and i've ran into those instances and then it falls back on your insurance and if you don't have that proper protection man it could it could really hurt you but yeah that that never really happens um but then we have an LLC as well. So we always recommend getting that LLC. So you limit your liability and it's not going to attack your personal assets. So in the event that that happened, it would only be, the business will only be responsible, not you. Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. I think I think that's really the main, the main thing. We always glamorize LLCs and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But when it really comes down to it is that LLC is going to separate you from the business operations. So if that was to happen, I'm sure there's going to be uh, legal process that's going to get drawn out. I can sleep better at night knowing that as I'm going through this legal process, the only thing my my house isn't at isn't at stake. My 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 family's money is not at stake, right? The only thing that's actually at stake here is the business operations. That's key in any business, but especially mm-hmm. in 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 the car business because everything is really tied to insurance. So you want to make sure that I think buying the cars in the LLC and truly operating within that limited liability capacity is so important for any circumstance that could mm-hmm. come up. Yeah, and I would say as a side note too, it's my CPA background coming in. That's like, it. You can't, 
you like you had that LLC, that's cool and all, but if you're piercing the corporate veil, which is essentially mixing your business and personal assets and like your business bank account, you you don't got that protection no more. So that's super important. So you really want to make sure that you're operating your business like a business. Like you got to make sure to put yourself on payroll and whatnot and just make sure you're really not mixing personal and business because they can come after you. Like if you got a, if the other individual has a smart lawyer, they can ask for your bank statements. And if they see anything that's, you know, that gives them the evidence to say that you're mixing, you know, business and personal, it's over with. Mm -hmm. They're going to come after all your personal assets. So yeah, you right. really got to make sure you're doing things the right way. Right. Like I got a um I got a friend. And this is a different industry, by the way. He's in the trucking industry, and one of his drivers was out on the road, fell asleep, crashed, mm -hmm. and killed somebody. And uh, mm -hmm. like he did, he had his paperwork set up, but he didn't have the structure, the right paperwork set up, mm -hmm. and he had to come out of pocket three hundred twenty five thousand to pay for it, pay for the loss. Man. You know what I'm saying? So all the stuff y'all saying that's extremely important. Like you can't when it comes to business, you can't half ass it. You can't just be mm -hmm. on some trying to on some hood on some hood shit, how mm -hmm. you gonna handle your business? Like, America is running on documentation. Mm -hmm. If right. your documentation ain't right, when something goes south, and nine times out of 10, something eventually gonna go south, you the one that's gonna be effed at mm -hmm. the end of the day. So you gotta have that, that, that paperwork right. And this mm -hmm. this my um final question for y'all. So, I like to ask this question because it's, it's, it's different for everybody. So for y'all, in y'all opinion, because you know, this is all about financial stability, building wealth. So in y'all opinion, what is wealth to y'all to me wealth is freedom man freedom of time like you don't have no obligations to other individuals and you're able to take care of everybody that's important to you while doing the things that you love so i think that's what wealth is to me uh, and that's what i'm that's what i'm seeking Shh, i couldn't have said it no better look wealth is absolutely freedom uh when it comes when it comes down to it having control over your time that is the ultimate form of wealth yep. the ultimate form of wealth you can wake up make your own decisions, not have to answer to anybody and really be able, whether it be family, whatever it is that's important to you, you're able to actually do what's important to you. That's mm -hmm. that's the ultimate wealth. And I think that's what we should all, mm -hmm. all be chasing. Mm -hmm. Is that a number for y'all? Because people always ask me, they're like, uh -oh. so what's your number? I'm like, what y'all mean? They be like, what's the, what's the number you that got? That freedom number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you, look, everybody's going to have a different, exactly. a different freedom number because yeah. it's going to be dependent on what type of lifestyle do you want to live. Exactly. Right? Some people can live very frugally, but they happy. Yep. As, as long as you, they can live off of three, four, five thousand dollars a month, they good. Cool. If, if that's for you, that's for you. That's technically, that's their version of wealth. Yep. You know what I mean? Because they, they free. They free. But really, it's going to come down to what is the number that you can create freedom for yourself and live the lifestyle that you want to accomplish? We all we all got that number. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I don't got that number, but <laughs> 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 so for me, I used to have a number. I used to want to. I used to want a hundred mil, but then I'm like, I don't really want to limit myself because I know a lot of times the universe they, it's gonna give you exactly what you ask for. Yep. So I'm mm -hmm. like. I could be I could be destined for a billy. I don't know. So I don't really want to limit myself. I just want to really just go hard and see how many people I can impact. And if that's in the cards for me, then so be it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Steven said, when he said, he said, why would you, um, what, do you what was the term? I he can't said, uh, Why would you put, lim put a limit on your end? Yo, put a limit on your uh, finite potential or something like no, that. No, your infinite potential. Infinite a limit, potential. limit, a limited number on a infinite potential. Yeah, so he it was a bar though, and I and I love that, and I like that y'all said that because I think a lot of people they'll put a specific number on wealth. They'll say it might be five million, it might be ten million, it might be twenty. But in my opinion, the real answer is what you said. It's all depending on your lifestyle. Some people they don't care for things. I know me personally. I like doing dope shit. I like doing fly shit, nice shit. So I know <laughs> five million wouldn't be enough for me for the stuff I want to do. Nice. So, but for somebody else, that's, they could chill probably for the rest of their life. What's up, dude? I found it. Why are we <laughs> limiting our infinite potential with finite numbers? There, mm. that's, that's a bar. Yeah, yeah, that's a bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had to get that back. Yeah, yeah. we had we had to say that we could we could we couldn't paraphrase that man. We had to we had to get that one right. But um, yeah. Before we wrap up, was there anything else that y'all wanted to uh? Discuss that the people know all that good stuff. We gonna make sure y'all plug in everything. But was there anything else y'all wanted to say before we let y'all go? Man, I'll say the last thing because I realized that a lot of people they just struggle with self confidence and being mm. as someone that did myself, man. I'll just tell somebody out there listening that's struggling with self confidence, man. Just take a second, list out all your strengths and list out everything that you want to accomplish and list out you know strengths that you want to have. 
and then every day just put one foot in front of the other and just go after just work for it like do whatever you have to do get obsessed with really becoming the person that you want to be because mm. that's really what worked for me um and i know once you take action every single day like it just snowballs it's a snowball effect and over time you just you really become that person you'll just look up one day and you'll be exactly where you want to be i like yeah. that that's great like I, I would say for me what i want everyone to understand is the importance of taking action like we said in the in the beginning right we're listening to podcasts we're on we're on youtube and everything like that don't be that person that hoards information right because there's people die with loads of information that they just never took action on when you get information when you get a play that sounds like it's going to work for you or you get whatever it, it may be make sure that you take that action immediately immediately like literally like i said listening to a podcast listening to to brian on a, on this podcast right mm -hmm. on this podcast i'm like that play makes sense for where i'm at right now run it that changed everything f for me as far as getting getting into this business and being able to scale it so when y'all get the information take action on it don't be like so many people out here that are just going course after course Hoarding, hoarding the information and never taking action on it. Yep. It's so important to actually get out there, get the info, but you got you got to put it to work. You got to put it you to work. You got to, because it ain't going to mean you're just going to be sitting on a bunch of information, talking to people like you did something. You ain't did nothing. They'd be like, you know everything about car rentals. They might say, how many you got? <laughs> oh, I ain't bought none yet. It's, uh, I'm, 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 but I know the yeah. business. <laughs> right, like, come on, get out of here, man. But I just want to say, man, I, I definitely appreciate y'all both coming out here to get this done, man, this was a dope episode, man. I had fun doing this. We're going to definitely have to make sure this happened again. But before we let y'all go, y'all, man, I'm plugging everything where people can find y'all, follow y'all, buy the course, everything y'all got. Yeah, so for me, you can find me on Instagram and, on, and Twitter at the infamous CPA. Uh, all my links are in the bio. I got some free resources, and that's where you can find the course as well. Yeah, same, same for me. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, the wealthy G. All of the links are there. Super interactive. Mm -hmm. Let's tap in. Yep, and we're gonna have the uh, we're gonna have the course link in the description of this podcast episode for those that want to purchase it. And wrapping up, you guys can find me on all platforms at Xavier C. Miller, also uh, on YouTube, and you can follow the Million of Mindsets podcast. Make sure you subscribe. Like I said, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the channel, rate, leave a review, five star rating, of course, all that good stuff. <laughs> and D, what's your info? And you can find me on Instagram at Deanna Kent, Twitter Deanna S. Kent, and you can find me on YouTube at Lessons in Life and Luxury. And if you guys haven't already, make sure you go ahead and copy Xavier's Crypto Guide. That's at <laughs> www.guidetocrypto.com. That guy has everything you literally need to know to make your mm -hmm. first investment in crypto. 13 double coins that everybody should be investing in for the long term, taxes, all that good stuff. So make sure you guys go and copy Thank that. you. I really appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Yeah. I always forget. <laughs> I always forget. So thank you. Thank you. And that's all we got for y'all on this episode of Million of Mindsets Podcast. See you guys next episode. Peace. Peace. You gotta get your brain right if you're trying to make a million dollars If you ain't gonna do it for yourself, then do it for your mama Only stay surrounded by them people, if you know they solid Elevate your hustle up today to double up your profit Trying to learn some game, Xavier y'all gonna talk about it No Deanna, speak that shit that everybody voucher Ain't no more excuses valid, get up off the couch and get up in your bag To your bank account, need an accountant